All right, uh, I guess it's good afternoon, everyone. It's um, Wednesday, October 13th. That's about 140. I wanted to go over uh, chapter six, the second part, and go over um, endochondral um, ossification of bone for the M, uh, for the, um, the fetus. And you know, I remember I talked to you guys in class about you know, as, uh, as humans, we don't um, birth our young fully developed. And I, you know, I said, I grew up on a farm and you literally would have a calf born or, uh, you know, called a pony, a, a horse or whatever, and they were up and walking very, very quickly. So uh, we're not like that, right? Our, when it's gonna pop into chapter six, and go over some basics with that. And I'll try to jump into chapter seven if I have some time. So, <clears throat> so bone development, um, it's not super critical, but you should have an idea of how <clears throat> uh, we, we generate um, Bone and just please remember it usually starts with cartilage and it ossifies. Um, This room with the air, I don't know. I can. So, ossification, osteogenesis. So, osteo, remember I said in class, always means bone. Whenever you see that, it's going to pertain to bone. Genesis usually is new beginning or um, in the beginning, uh, you know, the book of Genesis, or uh, yeah, usually it's a beginning or an. Um, yeah, we'll just go with that. <clears throat> it's a process of bone tissue formation. Formation of bony skeleton begins in month two of development. So, um, you know, after uh, the second month, the bone will start developing. Before that, you know, we talked a little bit about the neurotube and the nervous system, and I talked to you all of you about folate, vitamin B9, and without it in the first trimester, you can't produce DNA, but without DNA, that really the mitotic division doesn't go so real well. And that's where you have some little tube deficiencies. So I wanna make sure if you're childbearing years that you are um, consuming uh, vitamin B9, it's extremely important. <clears throat> so postnatal growth occurs until early adulthood. So that postnatal, so after you're born, your bone growth um, occurs until early adulthood. It depends on male or female. Females, you know, we could just say 17 to 20. Males, we could say 18 to 24. And we'll talk <clears throat> again about the epiphyseal plate that I talked about in lecture, and I'll show you here on the bone. Remember that is, epiphyseal plate is very, very active mitotically, and it's gonna <clears throat> uh, grow um, from inferior to superior. And then once that epiphyseal plate seals, there's no more longitudinal growth. So the, the person, male or female, can't get any taller. The only way it can grow is appositional growth. And we talked about that circumferential growth, contingent upon how much wear and tear. And then we talked, I'm not sure about Wolf's Law and uh, bone remodeling. So we'll talk about that. So up until about eight weeks, <clears throat> the fibrous membrane and hyaline cartilage of fetal skeleton are replaced with bone tissue. And remember, we saw hyaline cartilage in the histology, and we said it was going to be on the ends of all the long bones, and whether <clears throat> whether there's any articulation within the bone, we want that cartilage there. And we're also seeing it's made up of fibrous membranes, so you could think of that as, um, uh, you know, like. Uh, I don't want to say cheesecloth or chicken wire, but if you were going to um, 
cement something or whatever you'd want some kind of a foundation to fill it in. And hyaline card is a fetal skeleton are replaced with bone tissue. So they could ask you a question about, you know, what um, what's the precursor of bone in the infant or whatever. And they'll work in Highland Carter to see that how does, does a student know how it develops. So endo, endochondral. So remember, endo is always that inner lining, always. And then when I say always, there's always going to be an exception. But <clears throat> endo is usually the inside of the lumen or the inside lining. Chondral, I said, always refers to cartilage, or it should always refer to cartilage. Ossification, ossification just means it ossifies or turns to bone. <clears throat> so they're saying the inside lining that's made of cartilage ossifies or, or calcifies or mineral salts is, are deposited. Bone forms are replacing hyaline cartilage. Bones are called cartilage or endochondral bones. So just kind of the back of your mind, um, not to go on for hours, but just realize that and I said in class, you know, none of you, I said, have any of you um, had a child, a couple of you raised your hands, and I said, well, did you give birth to a full bone skeleton? No. <clears throat> so just realize that it's cartilage and it ossifies over time. Forms most of the skeleton. Intramembranous ossification. So intramembranous. So think of inner. It could be a sandwich. It's a membrane. Ossification is always going to be that calcification or hardening with mineral salts. Bone developed by fibrous membrane. Bones are called um, membrane bones. And what we're going to learn that some of those could be um, the skull and the clavicle, or you could think of some of your um, more flat bones that would be have a very, very thin <clears throat> medullary area, maybe more cortical bones. And we showed, you know, I showed you guys that in class. So endochondral ossification. So remember, this is the line. Forms essentially all bones inferior to the skull, inferior to the base of the skull, except the clavicles. So everything from the skull down, it's going to be endochondral ossification. Begins late in month two of development, as we stated earlier. <clears throat> Uses previously formed hyaline cartilage models. All right. So they're going to. You know, sometime in the future, they're going to ask you, you know, what um, is a precursor to bone, or they're going to want you to know it's hyaline cartilage. Requires a breakdown of hyaline cartilage prior to ossification. So we have to break that cartilage down. And um, in the lecture, we talked about um, chondroblasts, chondrocytes, and we'll see these coming up, you know, uh, osteoblasts, osteocytes, and how they're going to lay down the matrix. And then uh, <clears throat> chondroblasts will get caught in that lacunae. So that's the, the little uh, area they live in. And then it, it uh, turns into an or a chondroblast. And I said chondroblasts are sort of the executors. They kind of watch out for everything. But the blasts are really doing all the work, more or less. All right, requires breakdown of hyaline cartilage prior to ossification. Begins at primary ossification center in the center of the shaft. So we see pictures coming up and they're going to show you an area in the middle that's going to be the primary ossification center. And what that just means is the beginning part of where the hardening of the cartilage turns, ossification. So um, the um, deposit of the minerals, I remember, where does that bone development start? And it's just set the primary ossification center. Blood vessels infiltrate the perichondrium. Uh, Peri always means around, chondrium means cartilage, converted to the periosteum. So I told you all that the bones were very, very metabolically active. You have to have a blood source coming in. <clears throat> it perforates through the periosteum, which is where in the adult um, body, it's the attachment site for the tendons, for the muscles. So peri means around, chondra always means cartilage, osteum always means bone. So it's going to be the outside perimeter covering. Right? Mesenchymal cells specialize in the osteoblasts. So they're just saying, you know, I talked to you guys about the um, the primary germ layers and embryology just real briefly, but they're just saying mesenchymal cells specialize in osteoblasts. Right? And we'll see, you know, where some of these blood lines come from later on, what germ layer they came from. 
five main steps in the process specification. So there's five steps. The bone collar forms around the diaphysis of the cartilage model. And remember we had, is that actual real bone? That body will have you guys. Just, we're gonna start learning the parts of the bone. So just saying bone collar forms around the diaphysis of the cartilage model. And we'll see graph or pic a graphic picture of that coming up. Central cartilage in the diaphysis calcifies, then it develops the cavities, periosteal bud. All right, so bud usually means peri, means around bud. It's going to be a very small area. <clears throat> Invades the cavities, leading to the formation of a spongy bone. Remember, once again, that spongy bone is that trabeculae, so the spongy bone. And depending on whether it's a long bone um, or a flat bone, there's always a cortical. Remember, the middle is always medullary. There's always going to be an outer area cortex. So once again, I'm going to say it again and again and again. Whenever there's a cortex, there's always a medulla. Whenever there's a medulla, there's always a cortex. Medulla is always in the middle. Corti uh, cortex or cortical is always around the outside. Right? So whether we're talking about the brain, the kidney, the adrenals, there's a, a medullary and a cortex. All right, so blood is made up of blood vessels, nerves, yellow marrow, osteogenic cells, so osteo, bone, genic. So these are going to be bone producing cells. And if it's a stem cell, it can turn into anything it wants, an osteoclast. All right, we'll talk about osteoblast and osteoclast when we start talking about the calcium regulation of your bloodstream. And I remember, and uh, Lecture last week, I specified that calcium is very, very, very heavily regulated. It's very, very fine tuned. Too much or too little is going to give you those neurological or um, muscle uh, issues that you have. And sometimes they're one mimics the other. So, why calcium is so heavily regulated? I remember in lecture, I told you guys that. Your body doesn't generally absorb all the calcium you eat unless you are pregnant. Then it will absorb more. And we have to remember <clears throat> we need that vitamin D for the calcium um, absorption. And we talked a little bit about D1, calcidiol in the liver, and then calcitriol, vitamin D3, which is the usable part done in the kidney. Right. <clears throat> So the diaphysis elongates and the medullary cavity forms. I'm going to read this to you, but um, you're probably better off looking at the picture, getting an idea of what everything's called, and then going back and reading it. All right. Or when you're doing any of these diagrams, just go, you know, sequentially one through whatever. All right. The diaphysis, the secondary ossification center, appears in the epiphysis. This is member. Epiphysis, epi means on. All right, so I'm going to pronounce it both ways in case you're here either way. So epiphysis or epiphysis depends on how it's pronounced. <clears throat> epiphysis ossifies. So once again, if it ossifies, it wasn't bone before, it was something else, like the cartilage. Highland cartilage remains only in the epiphyseal plates and articular cartilages. And we said that before, highland cartilage going to be on the end of every long bone where they articulate. Articulate means where they come together. And the epiphysis or epiphyseal plates <clears throat> is there going to be that growth center. And we want the hyaline cartilage. It's going to start generating, um, <clears throat> moving up, and it's going to ossify. As it ossifies, it's going to elongate the bone. Uh, it's very similar to what we're talking about um, your um, your skin cells and how I said they go from the basement membrane and they get pushed up, similar to that. All right, so endochondrial ossification is long. Oh, sorry, that's my center. <clears throat> All right, so here once again, there's the hyaline cartilage, which is the precursor. There's that bone collar, and I said the primary ossification center is going to be it's right there in the middle. All right, and please. Honestly, don't think it's all going to be perfect like this, but this is general a generalization. So it begins bone collar forms around the diaphysis, the hyaline cartilage, a model, and then we start having 
the primary ossification center is in the center, and that's where it starts to ossify. Right. <clears throat> so area of deteriorating cartilage matrix, which all started as hyaline cartilage, it's deteriorating. So one material is replacing the other. So cartilage calcifies in the center of the diaphysis and then develops cavities. So we're going to find out later that the long bone, the, the middle of it is called the diaphysis. And then once again, we have that. Remember, I said a body is a small area. So we're going to have that blood vessel perforating the perichondrium, which is going to turn into the periosteum later as it ossifies. So we're bringing the blood supply in because once again, this is really heavily metabolically active. We've got a lot of division going on. We're literally changing um, uh, calcium, we're changing, or cartilage, we're changing, we're calcifying it. And we're starting to make that spongy bone, that trabecular uh, mesh work. Remember, cortical bones is going to be outside, medullary bones in the middle. It's going to be that, it's going to have that spongy um, <clears throat> areolar shape like a sponge. And we want that because we want the marrow in there. We're going to want blood supply in there. This is where, you know, inside the bone is going to be where some of these uh, blood cells are made, whether they're white uh, blood cells or red blood cells or platelets. And then, remember, ossification always center starts in the middle. Secondary is going to be here. And then somewhere in between here is going to be where epiphyseal plates are going to start forming, and it's going to be the only residual portion of that cartilage, except on, on the articulations here, where they articulate or touch other bones, and then we're going to want that epiphyseal um, line for our elongation of the bones. The diaphysis elongates, and the medullary cavity forms, secondary ossification centers appear, and the epiphysis, or Epi means on the physis. So epiphysis is always going to be the end. The medullary area is going to be always in the middle. And then here we have more or less um, full ossification of the infant. And this is going to be similar to the bone set up as a, um, a child or a teenager or a young adult where the epiphyseal plate is where we're going to have the elongation. So the, the epiphysis here ossify when ossification is complete. The hyaline cartilage remains only in the epiphyseal plates and the articular cartilage. So it's all converted. And then once again, I said that uh, hyaline cartilage in the articular area, and it's going to be blue and glassy looking. And then we want the epiphyseal um, line here for growth. Now let's long bones. Now intramembranous ossification begins with a fibrous connective tissue membrane formed by that germ layer of the mesenchymal cells, forms the frontal, parietal, occipital, temporal, and the clavicle bones. So, <clears throat> excuse me. With the skull, it's going to form most of those bones that you guys should have learned last week or started to, to learn. All right, and the clavicles, we just used to call your collarbones. <clears throat> All right, so four major steps involved. Once again, I'm going to read it off to you, um, and then we're going to see um, pictures of it, which I generally find that. Uh, Myself and the students find that a little bit um, easier to, to grasp and memorize. So ossification centers, once again, we had the primary ossification in the middle of the medullary form of the long bones, and then the epiphyseal area, um, there's a secondary primary, uh, secondary ossification center. Ossification centers are formed uh, when the mesenchymal cells cluster and become osteoblasts. Remember, blasts are very young, active cells. Sites are going to be the older, um, mature adult cells. The osteoid is created, then calcified. So osteoid, all right, just think about that. 
we're talking about ossifying, it would be that matrix, all right? Some kind of um, <clears throat> material is gonna be needed, um, cartilaginous material to, to form something, and then we're gonna wanna uh, ossify or calcify it later. Woven bone is formed when the osteoid, that material is laid down around the blood vessels, resulting in the trabeculae. And once you've got the trabeculae, this is the wrong kind of bone, but what is that um, trabecular, that spongy kind of bone that <clears throat> I was joking, I said, who doesn't like sponge candy? There's one of you who didn't. All right. The outer layer of woven bone forms a periosteum once again. Outer layer of the woven bone forms a periosteum. Perium is around the osteum, and that's where we talked about this, the outside of the, the bone, where the tendons attach. And I said, if you guys ever <clears throat> go into practice, and somebody has a fall or um, had a car accident, and they, they go to get an x-ray, and nothing, a radiograph, and nothing shows up, Like I said, it's probably going to be a hairline fracture. You have to wait a couple of days for that callus formation, and then it'll show up. But if you're really not sure, remember I said, get out your tuning fork, give it a whack on your shoe, touch that solid end to the area in question, and the vibration will send the patient into orbit because the periosteum is very, very pain sensitive, very, very heavily uh, innervated. So lamellar, remember I said the two L's remind me of the, um, the ring structure or how it lays things down. <clears throat> lamellar bone replaces woven bone and red marrow appears. So there's your <clears throat> osteoid, is that material. There's mesenchymal cell from that germ layer. This is going to be the progenitor cell or the stem cell of all of these. In the collagen fiber. And I said, when you guys hear or see collagen, um, that's there for strength. All right, and then we have an ossification center. All right, osteoblasts are going to be those very, very active osteomans bone blasts active. So the osteoblasts, we can assume, are going to start laying down something in the osteoid to cause it to calcify or start turning it into bone. This is intramembranous ossification. This is for your skull and your clavicles. So these are going to be very, very thin <clears throat> bone. We're going to have a very, very thin um, trabecular woven bone in the middle and then a very, very dense cortical area on the outside. And so osteoid is secreted and calcifies. <clears throat> Osteoblasts continue to secrete osteoid, which calcifies in a few days. So the osteoblasts are very reactive. They're, re, they're secreting the osteoid, which starts to calcify. This is how we're going to start forming the bone. Trapped osteoblasts become osteocytes. So these guys are trapped in there. They can't really do a whole lot, so they just mature into osteocytes. And remember I said before <clears throat> that some extreme situations sometimes when things are damaged or there's a pathology or something going on, these osteocytes can revert back to osteoblasts if they need to. The human body is pretty incredible. So <clears throat> mesenchyme condensing to form the periosteum. So you look, that looks like it's very, very, um, not really, really structured, just kind of there for um, area. And then they're going to start lining up, mesenchyme condensing to start lining up, and then <clears throat> we know the periosteum is a durable layer on the outside of the bone. It's going to start becoming very, very compact, very, very um, durable, but once again, very, very pain sensitive. The trabeculae of the immature spongy bone is here. The trabeculae was that sponge candy looking spongy stuff that I, used to, I showed you guys before. So just, <clears throat> it's going to be very, very um, thin. And when we, if I, let's see if I can bring the, we have one, I think one box of real bones. <clears throat> I'll show you, um, we'll do a, a section of the skull where you can see the layer of bone.
Here's that fibrous periosteum. So we see how these lined up and they just became very, very formed and constructed a very, very um, rigid, unified uh, area there. There's a plate of compact bone. We'll see that in lab. <clears throat> Diplo or diplo is spongy bone. Cavities contain red marrow. All right, so when you're um, reading this, all right, so start learning. What does red marrow do? What does white marrow do? So believe me, this will all tie together at some point. <clears throat> so postnatal growth, so now the, the baby is born. And once again, we want them being born very, very pliable, especially that the head, if you're crowning and you had a full skeleton, that can be painful. And then we talked about the fontanelle and the little sutures and how these, this is very, very pliable. All right, so long bones grow lengthwise with interstitial longitudinal growth of the epiphyseal plate. It shows you that, sort of. <clears throat> Bone uh, increased thickness. Remember, it gets thickness through appositional growth. Bone stop growing during adolescence. Some facial bones continue to grow slowly through life. So you will see pictures of people when they're young, middle aged and older. Their facial structure will remain similar, but you'll see some differences because the, the facial bones can uh, continue to grow, especially the, um, the mandible. So people will look slightly different. All right, and most people look similar, but there are other people who look nothing like they looked when they were younger. So that's possible too. So interstitial growth requires presence of epiphyseal cartilage in the epiphyseal plate. So remember we said the hyaline cartilage, we had that, that um, primary ossification center, secondary ossification center, and the only thing that's left of the hyaline cartilage is the epiphyseal plates, <clears throat> all right? and we're articulated to another, another bone. So we need that physical plate, but then once again, once that seals or stops growing, you can no longer get any taller. That physical plate consists of five zones and just read through these and they'll make sense to you. Resting, placentin, um, quintessential or placental zone, proliferation. We know if things proliferate, they grow. Hypertrophic, <clears throat> hypertrophic. So hyper means more, trophic usually means size or number, all right? Calcification zone and then ossification. <clears throat> so that makes sense. We have nothing's going on. It's starting to grow. It starts to really, really go with hypertrophic zone. Then it starts to calcify. The, the cartilage, the hyaline cartilage is moving those cells up. As they move up, they become just like those uh, skin cells. They become less and less um, <clears throat> like the basement membrane and they become more and more like the apical edge. Well, here they become, um, as they move, they become less and less cartilaginous and much more ossified. Right, so resting zone area of cartilage on the physical side of the physical plate that is relatively inactive. All right, she's kind of hanging out. It would be really inactive if it was, <clears throat> you know, ages one through maybe 10. All right, so once they start hitting puberty or start growing, it becomes very, very active. <clears throat> and I've had, um, you know, I'm sure when you're in high school and you would see someone, um, at the end of the year, and then you see them um, in the, the fall, and they literally grow in an inch or two. It happens, and I've had <clears throat> patients when they're they're teenagers. You know, I might see them every three months, or maybe every six months, or whatever, and literally they they grow like it looks like they grow overnight. Right, so especially if you see patients from, you know, when they're newborn and then, you know, the next thing you know, they're starting college or high school, it's just, you know, no experience, all that. <clears throat> so proliferation and growth zone, 
area of cartilage on the diaphysis, the diaphysis or diaphysis side of the epiphyseal plate that's rapidly dividing. So just when you look at the pictures, just figure out, well, where is it started? The epiphyseal plate and it's growing up, right? New, new cells form, move upward, pushing up to the epiphysis away from the diaphysis, causing lengthening. Hypertrophic trophic zone area with all their chondrocytes closer to the diaphysis, cartilage, <coughs> lacunae. Remember, those are those little areas they rest in. Enlarge in a row, forming interconnecting spaces. And then this is where the next stage is the calcification zone. Surrounding cartilage matrix calcifies, chondrocytes, adult, <coughs> cartilage will die and deteriorate. In the ossification zone is exactly what it says. It's ossifying, turning into bone. Chondrocyte deterioration leaves long spicules, and you'll see they're going to be very spiked. Pictures of calcified cartilage at the epiphysis diaphysis junction. All right, then those spicules, they start eroding away. The osteoclasts are breaking them down, and they convert them into a new bone by the osteoblast. So osteoclasts usually break things down. Osteoblasts build it up. So I would say blast to build, osteoclast, they break down. Ultimately, place with spongy bone, <coughs> medullary cavity enlarges as spicules are eroded. So the spicules, and they just named them that because they were, um, you can't say star shaped, but they're gonna, you're gonna see the, the orientation and the um, cartilage is gonna have little uh, areas of calcification. You still hear literally, this is a radiograph. Okay, so <clears throat> this person, if I looked at this, didn't know the age, I would say, well, they sheared it off. They took a blow to the knee and they sheared this off. Or I'm gonna say, <clears throat> all right, this patient um, is definitely under the age of 21 because the epiphyseal plate's still there. <clears throat> there's the there's the calcified um, cardiospicule and there's the osseous tissue. So just figure out how it grows. So this is the resting zone. They're proliferating. They're getting super active. They're starting to calcify. And we'll start seeing those spicules in here and then they'll start ossifying. <clears throat> Near the end of adolescence, chondrial blasts divide less often. So at the end of adolescence, they just stop growing quickly. Epiphyseal plate thins and it's replaced by bone. Epiphyseal plate closure is key. Occurs when the epiphysis and um, diaphysis fuse. When they, when these two fuse, the epiphyseal plate is sealed. Sealed. <clears throat> You'll see the epiphyseal plate right there. Okay. And then here's their rough estimate. Females occurs around age 18, males around 21, but I've, I've known a lot of males who literally um, <clears throat> still were going through college. And then sometimes they don't stop going through them. Same thing with eyesight. Sometimes their eyes will change up until the age 24. And so as they're growing taller, they're getting, um, their feet are getting longer, eyes can change. <clears throat> and then appositional growth, growing bone, or growing bones widen as they lengthen through appositional growth around, can occur throughout life. I remember I talked to you guys about Wolf's Law and how your bones are constantly being broken down and built back up. And they generally regenerate themselves every seven years. And I said, if I took a radiograph of all of you in class now, and then you came back in seven years, you know, as NPs or doctors or physical therapists or anesthetic or um, anesthesiologists or whatever you decide you want to do, you may change your mind halfway through a program. But if you come back seven years later and we radiograph you again, I said not one single 
theoretically not one single one of those um, osteo sites would be the same. So bone thickens in response to increased stress from muscular activity and or added weight. So if somebody is extremely obese, <clears throat> they got to carry that weight around. You're putting a lot of stress on those bones. They can't get taller, but they know enough that they have to get um, thicker, wider for the additional um, stress. Or you know, if we let's just say that we. <clears throat> In the country, everyone had to work doing something physical. All right, even the frailest person, if they lived through it, their bones would start to thicken because of the extra muscle mass and the extra uh, strain and stress they put on them. The bones remodel themselves thicker appositionally due to the stress. Osteoblasts beneath the periosteum secrete bone matrix on the external bone. And we did mention this last class. <clears throat> so just realize the osteoblasts, those are active cells that are underneath that periosteum, which is the most superficial. And so just deep to that, they're secreting bone matrix. All right. The osteoclasts remove bone on the, on the osteal surface, and then usually <clears throat> more building up than breaking down, which leads to thicker, stronger bones <clears throat> that is not too heavy. So for growth, you need them to build up to be faster than the breakdown. And the reverse usually happens as people at the age of 40, 50, or 60. They literally, in every aspect of their body, um, every process, the breakdown is usually level with the buildup or is faster. So that's why it takes a lot longer to recover from injury or healing when you're older because you break things down um, about the same, but the buildup process isn't as quick. So here's a before growth and remodeling, after growth <clears throat> and remodeling, just showing you um, how things can grow in length. So bone that was here has been resorbed building it up. We, we, you know, we see that we're growing from the epiphyseal plate upward. <clears throat> okay, so a little bit of hormonal regulation of bone growth. <clears throat> uh, we'll talk about this again when we talk about, um, I think we get into it again. Um, endocrine system Beginning of AMP2, I think. So, growth hormone, most important hormone in stimulating epiphyseal plate activity in infancy and childhood. So, you need growth hormone from the uh, anterior pituitary gland. All right, and that's going to be stimulated. Um, no, we don't do any type. Yeah, we won't get into that. We'll, we'll talk about that later. All right, so thyroid hormone modulates activities of growth hormone, ensuring proper proportions. Right? If you had a, th a thyroid deficiency, whether it was underactive or overactive, it would start affecting your metabolism. If you're pregnant and you have a thyroid problem, you can start, uh, you'll have myxidemia and you can start having creatism, things like that. Testosterone in males and estrogen in females at puberty promote adolescent growth spurts. And growth by inducing um, a physio plate closure. So at some point, um, <clears throat> the body will induce the physio plate to close. Or you know, if, if they didn't, we'd be um, seven feet tall. And if there's some people that have growth hormone spurts during uh, adolescence and adulthood, and they have giant tail. Excess or deficiency of any hormones cause abnormal skeletal growth. You know, when you have um, acromegalia in adulthood, where they have this growth hormone spurt for some reason, there's a problem with the anterior pituitary gland. <clears throat> could be uh, some kind of cancerous growth or something, or we could have, uh, yeah, we could have cancer somewhere else in the body producing um, 
those hormones somewhere. So they really can't get taller really, but they'll start getting bigger appositional growth. So their skull will get bigger, their the soles of the feet will get uh, bigger, their jaw will start protruding. About five to seven percent of bone mass is recycled every week. Spongy bone is replaced every three to four years. Compact bone is replaced every 10 years. All right. <clears throat> so, um, you know, I, I just want you guys to kind of know Wolf's Law, which is every seven years. Uh, but just realize it's your bones are just realize they're constantly breaking down and rebuilding. You want that because you want those bones to have a little bit of that fibrous cartilage and you want them to have a little bit of bend to them. So they don't shear. If they get if they get too uh, osteoporotic or too um, hard, um, it would be like chalk. You can just snap them in half. So you want them to be a little bit a little bit pliable. Bone remodeling consists of both bone deposit and bone reabsorption. Because of the services of both the periosteum and the endosteum. Remodeling units, packets of adjacent osteoblasts and osteoclasts coordinate remodeling process. So they coordinate. One breaks them down, the other one builds it back up. Resorption is a function of osteoclasts. Remember, they break it down. <clears throat> and osteoclasts break it down or they reabsorb bone. They break down the um, calcium phosphate, magnesium. They break down those mineral salts. <clears throat> Dig depressions or grooves as they break down the matrix, secrete lysosomal enzymes and protons. Hydrogen that digest matrix. <clears throat> so they're secreting something, lysosomes that go in and break down that matrix. <clears throat> Acidity converts calcium salts to soluble forms. Right. And if you want to do an experiment, take a, <clears throat> you could do a chicken wing, chicken bone. So take a, a chicken bone or a chicken wing and put it in a glass container and put some vinegar in it, which is um, yeah, it's not super acidic. And then give it a week or two, and then you'll see that you can actually take that bone, you can bend it. Because the acidity of the vinegar took all the calcium salts out, made it soluble in the vinegar, and it's very, very pliable. Osteoclasts also phagocytose. Remember, phagos eat demineralized matrix and dead osteocytes, so they go in and they clean those up. Digestive products are transcytosed. Remember, exocytosis, <clears throat> to go across the cell and release it the interstitial fluid and then into the blood. Brings it back into that capillary bed, refocuses or recirculates to the body. And remember, your kidneys clean all that out, liver cleans it all out. Once uh, resorption is complete, osteoclasts undergo apoptosis. <clears throat> so once their job is done, the adult um, bone cells undergo apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. They go in, the mission is complete, they just die off. So they can't live forever. Right. Osteoclast activation involves parathyroid hormone and immune T cell proteins. All right. So we'll talk about the parathyroid uh, hormone. When we get into the endocrine system, but they're going to be around your uh, thyroid gland, and you can have anywhere from six to eight to twelve of these. All right? <clears throat> and they're going to regulate, help regulate calcium in your bloodstream. Bone deposit. So new bone matrix is deposited by osteoblasts. So the osteoclasts just came through, digested all that matrix using lysomes and hydrogen. All right. Then when their job is complete, they form apoptosis, they get reabsorbed um, into the bloodstream, your body recirculates those. All right, now we have to we have to start building the bone back up. Osteoid seam, the band of unmineralized bone matrix that uh, marks area of new matrix. So it's going to lay down this osteoid, remember it's that material, a seam or a line. Calcification front, you know, when a weather front comes in or there's a Military front, there's an area. <clears throat> Abrupt transition zone between osteoid seam and older mineralized bone. You have a seam or a band of unmineralized bone matrix. We just want to clean it all up. 
plug it all down. Then we have a calcification button that comes butts up right against it. Trigger for deposit, not confirmed, but may include. All right, so <clears throat> any kind of mechanical signs or there's a stress or strain, bodies just say, oh, I need to build that up. Increased concentration of calcium and phosphate ions from hydroxyapatite formation. Right. Matrix proteins that bind and concentrate calcium. So these are all going to be signals. These are all going to be triggers that are going to cause it to want to deposit. <clears throat> so any kind of mechanical um, stress or strain is going to trigger that area to, to rebuild or, or fortify it. Increased concentration of calcium and phosphate, because those are the minerals, they, the mineral salts that they need for um, ossification. So if there's increased concentrations in that area, um, we know that we're going to start making the hydroxyapatite formation, which is the beginning of the matrix of the bone. Matrix proteins that bind and concentrate, uh, concentrate calcium. So for some reason, there's there's proteins in the body that are going to concentrate the calcium concentration, and they, they're realizing while well, it's doing that, getting uh, prepared for ossification. <clears throat> Appropriate amount of enzyme alkaline phosphatase, all right? Anything that ends in ASE is an enzyme, alkphos, right? Normalization. And if your alkaline phosphate enzymes are elevated in your liver, we, could, we can figure out there's something going on. You read in the blood work as alkphos, but it means uh, alkaline phosphates. All right, so remodeling occurs continuously, but is regulated by genetic factors in two control loops. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but for right now, we'll just deal with this, okay? Hormone controls, negative feedback loop that controls calcium levels. So negative feedback is when something plummets or is too high, your body does whatever it can do to bring it back to the, to the regular level, like a thermostat <clears throat> we talked about in class. It's the standard in every book, as opposed to positive feedback. Positive feedback is once something is initiated, the body propagates it more and more and more, right? Puts the accelerator on even more. This is negative feedback. Calcium functions in many processes. So just kind of keep in your mind, we talked about them. Uh, in class, we said, um, muscle nerve and someone even remembered that I said pH, right? Which was great. Blood coagulation, you need it. Gland and nerve secretions as well as cell division. And what's not in your book is it's also a buffer. All right, 99% of um, 120, 140 grams of calcium are found in your bones. So generally it's the major storage area, pretty much 100% of calcium storage. Intestinal absorption of calcium requires vitamin D. I mentioned that before. And vitamin D1 is made on your skin by the sun. Vitamin calcidiol is vitamin D1 is converted to calcidiol in the liver. And then <clears throat> calcidiol has to go to the kidney, turn to calcitriol, which is vitamin D. So your book doesn't tell you that, but you need vitamin D3 is the only one that's um, Bioactive, let's put it that way. And then response to mechanical stress. So if you're having a major workout um, regimen, or let's just say uh, you decided to go to boot camp, or um, you got a yeah, or you got a really really physical job, uh, you have a response to mechanical stress. Your body's going to actually go in and break down bone and rebuild it back up because you're going to need young, um, strong bones for the increased physical activity you're doing. Parathyroid produced by the parathyroid glands in response to low blood calcium. So parathyroid is going to be around your thyroid. And just think, they're produced by parathyroid going in response to low calcium levels. So if they're turned on by low calcium levels, it's going to do something that's going to increase. It's going to want to, the negative feedback is one of them going to want to bring it back to normal. So it's going to stimulate those osteoclasts to go in and it's going to say, you know what, go in and break down some bone. I need that calcium. And then I'm going to consume more calcium. I'm going to take that calcium and I'm going to put it back into the bone osteoid matrix, hydroxyapatite. 
area and rebuild that bone back up. But for right now, I need to go break it down because we just said 99% of it's stored there, right? So calcium is released into the blood, raising the levels. Parathyroid secretion stops when the homozygous calcium levels are reached. So if they're low, uh, parathyroid hormone stimulates the osteoclast. They go in and break down, right? To break down the calcium cells to get the, the blood level back up where it belongs. And then what we'll do is we'll wait until we consume more calcium, we'll reabsorb that. Not all of it, but some of it, and then we'll put it in the bloodstream and we'll rebuild the bones. Calcitonin, all right, calcitonin, I N, pro produced by parafollicular cells of the thyroid gland in response to high levels of, of blood calcium levels, all right. We'll take the calcium out of the blood and put it back into the bone. <clears throat> the effects are negligible, but at high pharmacological doses, it can lower blood calcium levels temporarily. So if you have extremely high um, calcium levels in your blood, which can be dangerous to your muscles and nerves, let's say you had some kind of a, an osteosarc or some kind of bone cancer that was breaking your bones down um, way too fast, your calcium levels got too high and your kidneys couldn't flush it, you started causing some neurological issues, they can give you a pharmacological um, equivalent of calcitonin to... Um, take some of that calcium and put it back into your bones. And there's that negative feedback loop. Right. Right. Even minute changes in blood calcium levels can cause severe neuromuscular problems. And I said, it's very, very highly regulated. Hypo, hypo under calcemia, hemia usually means blood. So um, low levels of calcium in your blood cause hyper excitability. See so people get super irritated super quickly. Hypercalcemia is so too much calcium in the blood, high levels cause non responsiveness. Right. Sustained high blood calcium levels can lead to deposits of calcium salts in blood vessels or kidneys or formation of kidney stones. All right. So a lot of people don't, they have constant kidney stones are very, very painful. They're not drinking enough fluid. Or they're breaking their bones are breaking down too quickly, right? But it can start calcifying your blood vessels, which is never a good thing. Start calcifying um, the kidneys, and with this blood vessels, you start seeing it in the capillary beds. First of all, usually, all right. <clears throat> all right. So leptin. Now that's usually um, a hormone that is. Um, Released from adipose tissue when you're satiated, when you're when you're full, it should be a signal. But your book says your hormone released by adipose tissue may play a role in bone density regulating regulation by inhibiting osteoblasts. All right, so another um, function of leptin is it can start figuring, it can start regulating your your um, osteoblasts. Remember, osteoblasts are going to build things up. Right, and that's possible to think about it. So if you were, it's released by adipose tissue. So if you were, let's say you were uh, 50, 60, 70, 100, 120 pounds overweight, you're gonna want to send a signal to your bones and say, listen, I'm gonna need you to make thicker bones because um, if I go to stand on my femur or tibia as it is now, I'm just gonna shear because of the weight, right? So serotonin. It's a hormone that can regulate your mood and things like that. So neurotransmitter regulates mood and sleep, also interferes with osteoblastic activity. Most serotonin is made in your gut, believe it or not. So um, now another reason why some people eat, if they eat and it makes them feel better, right, there's a response, there's a physiological reason for that. It's created in blood after a meal may inhibit bone turnover after a meal, so bone calcium is locked in when new calcium is flooding in the bloodstream. All right, no, no, nothing that I would um, test you on, but just start reading this and thinking, well, that kind of makes sense, all right? So if I'm, serotonin is released in my gut, and I feel better after I eat, it may inhibit 
uh, bone turnover after a meal because it's also going to tell um, when you're absorbing that, when you're eating that calcium to, to um, absorb it for use. All right, bone reflux uh, stresses they encounter. Bones are stressed when weight bears on them and muscles pull on them. That should make sense. So if you're putting more uh, force or shearing force or you're you're lifting weights, you're pulling on the periosteum, it's going to tell the bone, listen, this, I don't know when it's going to stop or get worse. So when you need to be prepared, we need to start building it up. Wolf's Law said the bones grow and remodel response to demands placed on them. So that's usually off center. So bones tend to bend, right? And you can see that in the older population too, All right? So you'll see um, <clears throat> if people are biomechanically off or, um, you know, if people, I, I mentioned you guys in class, if you were supinated or pronated with your feet, it can really make sure that the tip fib is not, or the, the femur and the tibia are not tracking right. Um, it'll put more shear on uh, the medial or lateral side. It can cause a lot of the shifting. Bending compresses one side, stretches the other. <clears throat> Diaphysis is the thickest where bending stresses are greatest. Bone can be hollow because compression and tension cancel each other out, the center of the bone. So <clears throat> you have compression and tension, all right? Um, <clears throat> it's gonna put more shear and force on the cortical area, less in the middle. So sometimes um, the center of the bone can become narrow and then they can snap uh, much easier. Just kind of showing you <clears throat> the compression center, but you know that's how this is your hip and the the force of your body here. It's distributed right through the neck of the femur. <clears throat> but some people when they shear a hip, sometimes they shear it here, sometimes they shear it here, and they can say, well, <clears throat> did the fall shear it, or did they get out of bed and their their femur snapped and they fell, right? It happens, we don't know. It could be the femur sheared they fell or they fell and the, and the fall causes the shear. It's very hard to say. But there's your fulcrum. There's your area of no stress right in the center. <clears throat> Wolfsall also explains, you know, handedness, right or left hand, results in thicker, stronger bones and corresponding upper limb. And I can just tell with a patient the minute I look at them or start palpating them, I'm like, well, they're left handed or right hand. I can tell instantly. <clears throat> Curved bones are thickest where, um, where they're most likely to buckle. So wherever the shearing force is, the body's going to automatically build that up. Typically, that, that woven bone forms trusses, and remember I said that that, uh, <clears throat> that woven bone or the jugular bone has that really weird look, and I said that in, in uh, Rome and a lot of these older cultures, they actually made these trusses that look just like, now if you look at some of the old cathedrals or whatever, they literally are those trusses and everything are exactly the same pattern. It distributes the weight evenly on the best it can with minimal amount of weight and thickness. Okay, weightlifters have enormous thickening at muscle attachment sites of most muscles they use where they attach into periosteum because you're constantly um, bowling on those. <clears throat> bones of fetus and bedridden people are featureless because of lack of stress on bones. So you'll see them and they'll just atrophy. There's no stress or um, shearing force on the attachment sites will become less and less and those just start breaking down. And mechanical stress um, causes remodeling by producing electrical signals when bone is deformed. I don't really care that you know that, but just, just realize your body has a way of knowing uh, what, where, how to, you know, what, when, where, and how all this stuff happens. <clears throat> All right, so fractures or breaks during youth, most fractures result from trauma, <clears throat> or unfortunately, other issue can be, you know, can be child abuse, right? one child syndrome, and 
um, when you get into the field, make sure that the story matches. <clears throat> Make sure the story matches the imaging. You always want to keep records of the radiographs or reports or whatever, because if you take a radiograph of someone and you see all these these uh, <clears throat> callus formations or areas of increased density on an X-ray, you say, well, you know, this this child is only 12 years old and they've got, you know, I, I'm seeing six breaks here. So either this person is super clumsy. <clears throat> they're into a lot of sports or there's something else going on here. You know, if you got a helicopter mom or a helicopter dad hovering over the kid, you'll learn that, you know, you want to start asking the right questions. But anyway, fractures are break. During youth, like I said, most fractures result from trauma or something else. <clears throat> In old age, most result from weakness of bone due to bone thinning. <clears throat> I'm just go over some kind of the fractures here. So, three either or fracture classifications. Position of the <clears throat> bone ends after the fracture. So, where are they in position after the fracture? Are they where they were? Are they, um, did they exit the skin? <clears throat> did they snap in half? All right, so non displaced ends remain normal in position. So, you look at the radiograph, we have a fracture here. The ends are non displaced or the fracture here. Displaced ends out of normal alignment. That means it was probably a really wicked twisting or turning motion that sheared it out of place. Completeness of break, complete broken all the way through and complete not broken all the way through. So, you, can, you know, if you're talking about a, they can't think of it. What's the name of the fracture when the, the kid sticks his uh, hand through the crib and they pull it back, the wrist through the crib and they pull it back out and they snap it. College, I think it's a college fracture, I think. <clears throat> and whether skin is penetrated. So open and calm, skin is penetrated or closed, skin is not penetrated. So we don't really, really want an open compound skin um, fracture because the bone is coming outside of the skin. And now you can bring in uh, all kinds of bacteria, Clostridium perfringes or whatever, some of these spore formers. Deep into the tissue, that's never a good thing. There's commuted compression fracture. I see this a lot um, on x rays. And I, <clears throat> when I see these, uh, I'm not going to say guys because some, some of the girls are, are guilty of it too at the gym, <clears throat> deadlifting and doing all kinds of. Uh, dead rows and squats with this ridiculous amount of weight. You know, they got the, the weight bar on their shoulders and they're squatting, you know, 150 pounds. Um, but sharing force gonna, is gonna compress these achievable bodies. And then <clears throat> realize your spinal cord's in here and you have nerve roots coming out here. So if you compress that, this opening here, that's real tiny and now you have nerve compression. If it's in your neck, you're going to start having some brachial plexus issues, and it's never a good thing. There is a <laughs> commuted fracture, and that was probably a plant and pivot situation where this person was playing football or soccer, and they planted their foot, and they turned, all right, and they just snapped the bone there. Yeah, I think this is the college fracture. It's like 20 years ago. <clears throat> but I think it's called a college fracture. And there's a um, a fracture, and that is moved. That you remember, this is a um, this is a child or an infant. Right? Um, <clears throat> the areas were really soft, or this was probably a blow to the head. You know, hopefully not with a hammer or whatever. But you can see that it sheared that bone and pushed it inward. Now there's. <clears throat> With an X-ray, you want to check the ABCs: asymmetry, border, um, oh, good lord, contrast. Right. You want to check all these things and see what's going on. Density. Treatment for a fracture in reduction, the alignment of the bone and bone ends. And <clears throat> you know, if it's a rib, as I mentioned in class, that can get a hairline fracture easily. And you really can't abrase that and do a 
a complete reduction with that because you're constantly breathing. So that rib is is going up and down, right? Or that bucket handle, constantly moving. Reduction, physician manipulates the correct position. Open reduction, the surgeon has to go in and pin it. Immobilization of the bone by a cast retraction unit for healing. And then remember, if you're immobilizing it, once again, all those bony attachment areas are going to become diminished. The muscles are going to atrophy because you're not releasing them. Uh, repair involves four major um, stages. We have a hematoma, that always means blood formation, fibrocartilage is callus. Remember, I said if you get a if you have a trauma and you're not picking up anything on a radiograph, you want to go in a couple of days later because this callus will start forming and that will be radiographically opaque. You'll see it. <clears throat> Bony callus formation and then you have bone remodeling. So hematoma formation, just realize hematoma, <clears throat> some kind of blood formation. Torn blood vessel hemorrhage forming a mass of clotted blood called a hematoma. Site is swollen, painful, and inflamed, and that should resorb itself over time. <clears throat> All right, so there's a hematoma. So this tore, um, this nutrient foramen, this, this perforating blood vessel that was feeding the medullary area, uh, fracture, this fractured, so all that blood escaped. It filled in this whole area. So that's gonna really stretch out the periosteum. It's very, very painful. <clears throat> and we're gonna hope that gets reabsorbed at some point. And we want that fibrocartilage callus formation. <clears throat> the capillaries grow into the hematoma. Phagocytic cells clear up the debris. So we have our macrophages. They go in and clean things up. They exocytosum, kind of like the street cleaners. Fibroblasts, remember those are active cells, secrete collagen fibers to span the break and connect the broken bones. And remember, collagen is going to be that very, very strong, durable. Material fibroblast cartilage and osteogenic <clears throat> bone producing cells begin uh, reconstruction of the bone, create a cartilage uh, matrix of repair tissue, similar to like when we, we have the, the, the cartilage um, formation originally of bones and the embryo, right? With the lead with the, with the osteoid or the cartilaginous uh, material, and then we ossify it later. <laughs> A massive <clears throat> repair tissue is called the fibrocartilage callus. All right, so you can see we the osteoblasts came in, or um, phagocytic cells, macrophages came in, cleaned it all up, replaced it with fibrocartilage, a very, very soft callus. We're going to bring in some new blood vessels for delivery of nutrients, but remember, cartilage is usually very avascular. And then we want the callus formation. So this is the um, soft callus, and then we really want a, a hard bony callus. That's really going to show up on an x-ray, right? Because x-rays really show um, osseous material. Um, any kind of soft tissue will show up as a slightly dense, hazy area, but um, radiographs are really good for osseous. Excuse me. I'm sorry. So there's a bony callus of spongy bone much more dense, this is all resorbing. This will show up on an x-ray for sure. So bone remodeling begins during bone callus formation and can use for several months, depending on what you broke or how active you are, how inactive you are, your age, nutrient, um, you know, what you're eating, what you're consuming. External material of the diaphysis exterior uh, with mammality cavities removed. So it's going to really go in and just start cleaning up all this over time. And if it does a really good job, if we x-ray that area years later, there might be some remnants of something, but it should look um, very, very normal. Just as the, um, you know, five or six years later, it should look pretty good. So there's a heel fracture in a perfect world, right? But everything is lined up. Let's see a little bit. This area here, 
little expansion. <clears throat> Some bone um, sores. If you hear about them, osteomalacia and rickets. Bones are too soft. We had a problem with that here in the east in the 1800s. No sunshine, so we couldn't produce vitamin D1, couldn't produce vitamin D2 and vitamin D3. And we said before, we need vitamin D for that calcium absorption so we can rebuild the bones. Osteoporosis, all right, that's our brittle bones. All right, generally, I'm going to say generally with the uh, Female population, um, middle age to older, uh, but we do see it in men. And Paget's disease, um, we'll see where um, there's too much uh, filling up of bone. Osteomalacia, bones are poorly mineralized. Osteoids produce, but calcium salts not adequately deposited because we can't, uh, we have a problem with vitamin D. Results in soft, weak bones, pain upon weight bearing. And you'll see the females just to have. Um, Uh, they'll have bowed feet or deformed um, limbs, generally, uh, and very, very painful when you put weight on it. Wickets, he said, was osteomalacia of children, specifically. Um, and as children are growing, um, their legs are going to bow, and because they're very, very soft, they don't have a lot of calcium. And like I said, if you want to take um, a chicken bone, Put it in vinegar. You can see sort of how pliable this can be. Um, and back in the day, we didn't have vitamin D capsules, so we have, we have cod liver oil. And it didn't come in pills; it came in a jar. And uh, as a kid, we used to have to take it, like a teaspoon of it, and it was trust me, nasty. <clears throat> Osteoporosis is a group of diseases in which bone reabsorption exceeds deposit. Right, so the bones are breaking down faster than they're rebuilding. Matrix remains normal, but bone mass declines. Spongy bone of the spine and neck or femur are most susceptible. And you can imagine the implications of um, if your uh, spine and neck um, are very, very um, susceptible to damage or compression, not really good. Vertebral or hip fractures are very, very common. <clears throat> Vertebral fractures can start uh, a whole litany of um, nerve compression, fractured hips can cause a lot of mobility issues. Actually fractured hip, depending on the age, sometimes the recovery rate of that can be 50%. <clears throat> There's normal bone density and there's osteoporotic. As you can just see all the air bubbles in there. So you can imagine this is going to break a lot easier. All right. <clears throat> so just some risks are right. age, uh, female estrogen has, you know, depending on hormonal, um, you know, like they could throw in alcoholism, poor nutrition, uh, not exercising, not any weight bearing, <clears throat> smoking, other alcohol and certain medications. <clears throat> so osteoporosis treatments would be calcium, gotta be <clears throat> bioavailable calcium. And then we don't even know if your body's gonna absorb it, right? Vitamin D supplements gotta be D3 weight bearing to produce stress on those bones so they're going to want to build up denser. <clears throat> There's some drugs I don't really care um, <clears throat> that we know that. So you guys can read through the rest of that. Paget disease, excessive haphazard bone deposits. All right, so called Paget's bone. And usually you'll see this um, in the skull through an x-ray. It'll just show really, really warped, weird, um, pattern of that cortical bone. Very high ratio of spongy to compact and reduced mineralization. Occurs in spine, pelvis, femur, and skull. Um, we've seen it oh, on school. We, we definitely saw it uh, on radiographs when we took uh, radiology. They'd show us the spine or the femur or the skull. And everything would look kind of normal at first. And then you, 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 know, you got to check your asymmetry, order, contrast. Right, and density and just say, oh, wait a minute, something's going on there. 
<clears throat> rarely occurs before age 40, so generally they're 40. Um, they'll say the patient uh, complains that uh, the tap doesn't fit anymore or something weird. They'll give you some kind of weird, um, <clears throat> but you can see here, right? It looks normal, but look at how dense that is. Okay, so in radiographs, the the more dense it is, the more of the radiation ionic, whatever that's supposed to um, land on the bucket of the film and expose it, it's going to absorb more of that. So it's going to be much, much whiter. So the whiter it is, the denser it is, the darker it is, like air is, is pretty much black. Uh, water or fat is like a little light gray, but this is definitely osseous. Right. <clears throat> so we're not going to get into that. Any of the, um, the only aspects of bone, but just realize some stuff from the beginning how it was originally um, laid down. Okay. Before I closed up here, this is actually a, a real fetal skeleton. You can see the front nail there. And I had some student grab this too tight and literally crushed the skull. That's literally a real. So if I shoot a flashlight through here, you can see this whole thing would light up. Okay, I'm going to end this here. I will try to pop this into YouTube.